Good morning. Hey, Peter, how are you? Very good. Uh, that's better. I had your volume down too low. Couldn't hear you for a second. Sorry about that. Okay. You're looking sharp today. Oh. Always the best rest of our number. Yeah. No, it's uh, getting colder. So more, uh, more layers. It was uh, minus two Celsius today. How about in New York? Uh, not that bad. On the nippy side, though. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, so the COVID madness gets worse. The governor has now canceled people's elective surgery in anticipation that the new variant of the virus may get here at some point in the near future. So meanwhile, we have people who need cancer surgery who are being informed that they can't have their operations because they might want to have the hospital rooms available for people getting COVID in a while. Uh, yeah, that's um, that's tough. I, I agree with um, with being um, careful, but going out and just the work that people need to um, yeah that, yeah that's just crazy. Oh uh, well, so let's see. It's Cyber Monday. Would you mind if I ask the crew if there are any apps that are on sale today that they'd recommend I add to my collection? Yeah, no, that's a good question, actually. Um, Author is, of course, of sale, on sale, but you have that already. So um, I think, uh, yeah, we should figure that out. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Hope it still is. I'm trying to figure out more marketing for it now, and it's really, really hard to break through the clutter. Yeah, it'd be good if you could get like, some student writing courses to assign it to their students for use. Yeah, that is and then, then you could say, you know, Syracuse University is using author for its freshman writing course. You might want to use it too. And that'd be a good marketing approach if you could get somebody at SU who could introduce it for a course. That's actually how, you know, it's interesting. The first time I discovered Tinderbox was when I was going through a campus visit to Syracuse real early on. When I was still trying to decide where I wanted to go. And there was a writing lab in one of the buildings and sure enough they were all using tinderbox and i looked over somebody's shoulder and said what's this and they said oh this is tinderbox that's actually interesting of course it's um it's clear that it would be uh you know that that, that would help but that that it would actually help you as a student be interesting in a course because it looks more sophisticated that's kind of interesting that that's your story Hmm. Maybe and then I should I, do something like don't teach the same old uh, uh, writing stuff, you know, teach this fancy looking thing. So that makes sense. So, oh, suddenly there's people in the room. Here I was moving images around on my desktop and uh, hello. Yeah, very good. How is everybody today? Uh, pretty good. Getting reacquainted. Doing well, though. Just got back into town. How was your Thanksgiving? It was nice. Uh, spent time with my in-laws. Um, they live in Philadelphia in uh, the East Coast. So always kind of a, a unique trip. But I had something amazing happen. And I need to share some pictures with you. Um, in this random small town in Pennsylvania called Kennett Square, there was a uh, computer museum. And okay. this, this had like the, some of the, the oldest machines I've ever seen. Uh, it was a four room kind of miniature museum run by a guy who's just doing this for fun and quite an incredible experience. I'll, I'll drop some photos into an email, but like total surprise being in uh, a, a town of 5,000 and there's a computing museum that was actually well built out. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, nice. Hi, Duke. It's been a while. How are you? I am okay. How are you? Me and everybody? Your mic input seems to be very high. Hi. Yeah, you came across a bit scratchy, but uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we celebrated Thanksgiving for the first time ever this year. 
it was just the realization that, you know, the American version of Halloween is taking over the world. And believe it or not, <laughs> kids here now have pinatas for their birthdays. I don't understand how that makes any sense. You know, the whole blindfolded smash the, the you know, carcass to get sweets. I, I don't get that one, but it's become popular from all kinds of kids here. But we decided, hey, Thanksgiving is a nice one. Sit down, be thankful, eat your dinner, go home. <laughs> or fall asleep, you know, whichever comes first. <laughs> Piñatas are Mexico. Yeah, exactly. So, they, yeah. They, But they're normal in America now, right? Uh, I'm in or, Mexico, so I'm not sure. No, but wouldn't you say that kids' birthdays in general in the States often have piñata things? I don't know. Yeah, I think it's pretty popular. Maybe we watch different movies. Something and not get yelled at. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so we have been um, looking into some VR stuff over the last few calls, and I'm wondering what direction we should have our calls going today. Mondays are supposed to be more about implementation now, right? So well, I'd like to I'd like to share an updated importer script. Um, this is in the code I'm pasting into the chat. It's relatively short. And it will allow you to extract the link database from a tinderbox file and turn it into a JSON file. Can you tell me how you would use that? And it doesn't want to let me paste into the chat window for some reason. It's weird. Hmm. Okay, you know, I'll email it as a file to you guys later on. Okay. I'll actually probably be more useful. Um, the reason to use it is that it will allow you to programmatically build a web page based on a Tinderbox file that will have access to all of the link relationships between the different notes in the Tinderbox file. It's actually relatively hard to get at that data from inside of Tinderbox currently. Um, but it's stored very neatly. It's like one little chunk of the XML near the back end of the save Tinderbox file itself. And then it's easy to get out of Tinderbox the node IDs. Um, links are usually created at HTML export time and there aren't particularly good hooks for getting at the information embedded in the links because the link can have a type associated with it and it can have some extra metadata that doesn't get exported directly into the link markup. And then the link markup's hard to work with if you want to be doing things with it programmatically once it's been rendered into XML, because then HTML, because then you have to parch, yeah, parse the HTML link to get the data back out of it. Whereas this way, you have the data sitting in a nice little file that you can directly query. So you could then simply go in and search through the array of links to find all links with a given source note or a given destination note. And you can pull out the external URLs. It also gives you the offset into the raw text of the notes where text notes appear. And you can't get that out of Tinderbox oh, directly if you want to do something interesting with it. Mm. So it's certainly, it's more relevant if you're using a programming language to take a database coming out of Tinderbox and do something non-standard with it other than using Tinderbox's built-in HTML rendering facilities. And it's only about 48 lines of code for Imba, which then would run under Node. So very simple, easy to get running. Right. Interesting. I wonder if Brandel will be joining us today. I think he wanted to show more than he did on Friday. Um, but Adam, you were talking about different sketches and ideas earlier. Yeah, I have a small little active reading prototype. OK. Um, maybe yeah inspired 
by the by some of the ideas floating around here. Um, um, I, I don't know if Alan is going to show up today. Um, we could just talk shit about them now because they'll be watching the recording. Say, what are you guys doing? Yeah, uh, but uh, so um, should I share it now and we'll go back to it if they join in? Yeah, nothing wrong with showing it twice. So let's see here. So um, this is. Um, these are a few articles from the Future of Textbooks um, from the EPUB version. So I imported them. This is in a web page or a, uh, a web-based reader. Um, and the idea here is that um, along the lines of liquid, well, is it called liquid text, that tool, the app? Um, Craig, not your tool. one is called no. liquid text, yes. Like, um, to my great annoyance, having yeah, started uh, with liquid information in the 90s, but anyway. Uh, and I've said a couple of times to you, Frode, that I really want to have margins, uh, for, use the margins more, and you have the, the magic margins. Um, but this is more for the reading ex experience, but I, I want to use the margins both for reading and um, and uh, writing. So uh, this page is, di is divided by into three parts, the text here to the left, and then you have the margin, uh, and then you have a free uh, space that is not connected to the margin. Uh, so what you can do here is whenever you select a text, keyboard shortcuts, you can click the margin and get that word, that phrase over in the margin. So this is a way of extracting kind of landmarks for the text or ideas that you want to work with and they these follow these are the margin uh, when, when you send it to the margin it follows the text so if you want to uh, highlight a few words you just do that uh, um, and you can move them around and you can write your own uh, comments here uh, and these uh, my, the idea is that they uh, they stay here, and uh, the next time you open the document, you still have your uh, margin comments here. So th this is one way of extracting ideas and doing margin notes, basically. But you can move uh, move them around. But the other idea is um, uh, to to take. Let's say we have um, down to Klaus article, and he talks about um, the seven standards of textuality from. Uh, uh, from an old book. And um, if um, I click here, or uh, if I select, uh, so this is uh, the, this is your thinking space. It doesn't follow the, the text. Uh, this is the free form, uh, and that is why it has a different color and a grid to show that, uh, uh, that it's a different space. So here you have this, uh, um, some text, and you could, um, whenever you select text, uh, let's see where where I um, yeah so the seven um, standard seven standards of textuality you could press C to clip and then it clips it to that space uh, right now it and uh, no, I don't want to select the whole thing but let's say I take them and uh, and extract them so this is a way of playing with the text or uh, working with the text and you. Uh, could um, shape um, kind of a thinking space for it. So you take parts of the text, and then you could write uh, your own comments. And um, uh, um, so you form uh, you form um, new texts here, new thinking spaces uh, where you, where you can think about the different parts and connect them together. Uh, what I want to have is that whenever you hover over or uh, interact with the, with the text, it uh, automatically shows where it comes from and uh, it should know everything, kind of visual meta style, um, and also the lines that we had in the other prototype. So you, 
the, but I don't uh, I don't want the lines all the time. I just want them on, on interactions. You can see the source material in the original text. Um, this is a very basic idea that you build up your reading here. Uh, some th things are more permanent, like the margin comments and the margin extractions. Um, and these spaces can be per document or per per book. These uh, the right hand spaces, or they can be separate thinking spaces. So imagine that we have a few different tabs here. Tab for different uh, projects or think or readings, maybe. So you could have a, a one tab here for textuality. What is textuality, and you explore that from different. Uh, you bring in material from different books here. Um, Randell and Mark has snuck in. Oh, so they have. Um, do, do you want to just um, go back and start the, just start explaining the three different columns? Because uh, this is very cool. Um, uh, the, uh, these are three columns, the main text, um, the source text, and your margins, where you can bring uh, things free form. So you select text and you click anywhere in the margin or in your, uh, in your spaces. Uh, and also you have uh, keyboard shortcuts for uh, uh, for just bringing things to the margin. So whenever you select something, you can just bring it to margin. And uh, if you want to position it more, uh, you either click or move it around after the fact. And you can also uh, write here. So this is- Peter, do you have a question? Yes, I was wondering, could we mirror this so we could have two separate texts side by side with the clipboard, pinboard in the middle between them. So you'd have another margin to the right of the pinboard and then another column of text to the right of that. So we could have two things side by side and draw from them both. Yeah, th that is quite trivial to do. Um, my problem, my, my current problem is screen estate, at least on my 15-inch uh, MacBook. Um, um, yeah, it's good enough for this, but uh, adding more is uh, hard. And uh, if, uh, and uh, as you see, the actual thinking space is a bit cramped already. Um, so um, I imagine this will um, be uh, more useful in a, on a 4K monitor and uh, for, for real professionals with good, <laughs> with good monitors. Uh, um, and Adam, what, uh, do you have an iPad? Yep. A couple you of them. I haven't tried it on the iPad mini. Um, no, but can you support two screens or two windows? Because then if you can support two windows with the same environment, then you can just plug in an iPad or have it stand next to your Mac and it should work, right? Yep. Uh, what that breaks is a kind of fluid interaction where things move like it's one surface, I think. Um, so it's a, hard, a bit hard to do drag and drop over the borders of uh, of the web. So it mm -hmm. might, it can be simulated, I think. Yeah, but um, um, and even this prototype is is not really. Um, Alan was wishing for a, a real Chrome-less version, and it still has some Chrome in the in the sense that you. The, uh, the the division between the margin and uh, and the thinking space has to be clear in, in some way. Now I did this uh, light grid uh, gray uh, gray uh, gray paper here or gray screen uh, gray background um, to divide it, but it's still already by doing that it feels like it's not one thing, one fluid thing. So I would uh, I would love to have it even more minimal here to to make it feel like um, but I'm not really sure how to then separate the the different uh, spaces because these the, you can imagine that the document is one space, but the, the other space is not connected and doesn't follow. So it has to be sep visually separated. But it would be nice to have it even more visually like closer, a bit closer together. Here, uh, one, one thing to notice here the the negative grid with a, which i think is underutilized where the grid is actually uh, lighter than the background color so it doesn't interfere with darker texts um, uh, so i think because often people use 
dark grids, and that interferes with uh, with dark text. So it could be good to go the other way. Um, so this is basically it. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing fancy. But uh, oh well, uh, one fancy thing is that you can throw things. If you really dislike the text, you can throw it into the margin, and uh, uh, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't hurt the text. Uh, but uh, uh, we talked about uh, uh, kinetic uh, to actually play with the text and have it. And uh, it's even more natural when you do it with uh, on the touch screen because it, it follows the finger and then you throw it. When you lift the finger, it, it keeps the momentum, and I, and I like that. Um, it feels like you're really working with the with the small phrases. It uh, stimulates something the, in in me at least. Uh, so this is it. This is uh, the idea that uh, you do active reading where you can pull out phrases as you see you fit, and then you write your own comment uh, comments uh, and thoughts around it. And I uh, personally, I want to have my uh, prompts drawer somewhere here, here where I can pull in good good uh, good questions and good principles and good uh, more material material for analyzing this so i have an intellectual drawer where i pull in uh, my favorite questions uh, that i have sharpened through the years so, uh, so i put them in here and actually write answers to those questions so i use them at, as prompts so thoughts i'm very impressed but i want to hear what the gang has to say I like it. Fine, thank you. I, I put a comment. <laughs> I put a comment in the chat. Um, you know, to the extent that even before you'd, you know, you kindly re-explained it to me. I think I, I'd immediately just, you know, watching you use it. But then again, I'm sort of, I'm probably someone who's a bit of a shoe in for this sort of thing. Yeah, I, I echo the same comments uh, that other people are making, that it, it seems uh, really uh, intuitive in terms of the way that the sort of contents are presented and separated. Um, one thing, you know, you were talking about chromelessness, um, a very useful thing even in 2D, um, but it's even better in 3D, obviously, is uh, making use of shadows and gradients to, indi uh, to indicate uh, perceptual depths. And so if you wanted the sense in which the document was on top of the cutting board, uh, then you could put a, a small yep. shadow on the surface uh, of the cutting board to indicate that it's behind it. And that might even be a, a mechanism to be able to kind of represent uh, what kind of uh, way forward for having multiple documents is that, that uh, given that the that central column is uh, hardbound as it, I think should be to the to the scroll height and offset of the document. Um, then maybe that that piece of the left plus the middle column is uh, do, does pertain specifically to a given document, and those things move together, and they perhaps are actual pieces that that are laid up that exist um, on the on the board, which is the thing that is more implicitly kind of infinite. Uh, and so then you might have potentially a zooming user interface uh, that uh, allows you to pull in and out of individual documents while then retaining the contents of the cutting board. Uh, but yeah, it's it's really cool, really, really exciting as a mechanism for being able to kind of deconstruct. So the question is what the main, uh, because you, you touch upon something here, is a document the main thing where you bring in boards or is a boards uh, is a board the main thing where you bring in documents as source material? Uh, kind of what is a what 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 is the outer uh, outer canvas? What is the outermost canvas where things live on? To, um, uh, and I think it would be nice to clarify that for 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 you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it, yeah. Wh wh which one is the which one is the landlord and which one is the tenant? Um, yeah. I. I had just sort of, because of, I guess actually because of the grid, uh, I had uh, likened it to the green and white cutting boards. Cutting yeah, <laughs> I have um, one under my keyboard here. It feels, uh, <laughs> maybe that is where I... <laughs> uh, and then the, the idea that that would mean that what, what the operations that you're undertaking are actually cutting a piece of paper on a bigger board. 
Um, but I, I, it would be interesting to invert that and think about what practical consequences come from that as well. I think it probably depends a little bit on the use case. I could imagine students using this. And I think the big thing for students is two things. One, learn stuff, obviously, but the other one is finding what to cite when they're ready to write their reports. So you said that the um, cutting board on the right could have different tabs. I think that makes a complete, a lot of sense. So a student would open up PDFs for one subject and read through and start populating the board on the right. And then when it comes time to citing, you know, when they would need to write, they can look at the text they've dragged out. And then, like you said, uh, double click on that or whatever interaction to see where it came from so they can instantly cite it in their, in their documents. So I really like the, um, the gray blocky space as the, um, as kind of a, always with a student. I could imagine you could even make an iPhone version of that. So that could kind of be a thinking space no matter what, where they are. They wouldn't necessarily have this great working space with the PDFs, but they could, you know, move around the ideas or something. And of course, if you allow students or user to define them, then uh, we have to figure out a way to make it compatible with the author's map. Yeah, that's kind of where, where my head went with this too. Adam, this is really cool. Um, the, the idea of setting your own markers alongside text uh, as you're reading is really neat. Um, before I make the tie to reader and author, I may have missed this. You can write in the in the margin yourself, or or is that not available right now? Oh, cool. So yeah, I like this a lot because I, I was kind of seeing the visual of uh, the different views that uh, you can pull up in Reader, and being able to summarize an area alongside a text marker while seeing just the the first sentence of of each paragraph, for instance that adds a different dimension to the comprehension. So that, that's really interesting to me. The, the, the grid thinking space that you've created here too, really neat. I'm, I'm trying to like kind of visualize and think through some applications for that, but as a free form thinking space, that's really effective. And if I'm reading on the iPad, that's usually what, what I do, just you know, kind of sketching those with the uh, pencil. But when I'm on a computer, I have to use a different program and yeah. it really deteriorates my reading experience. And it feels like I'm jumping from one place to the other. So yeah. I didn't have time to, uh, to get the, everything with pencil support in there, but I've played with it before to it actually write free form in the, um, mm. on the spaces. And I really like that to, to mix. Uh, I think the different input modalities, uh, the, they make, yeah, they stimulate the different things, but they also make the do document yours in a way. Yeah. And also access uh, landmarks in the document so you can remember where things were. Uh, so I really like mixing a bit, uh, not too many, but a few different colors and uh, mixing handwriting and, uh, and just single words or uh, small phrases. And uh, maybe, uh, yeah, of course, you can clip paragraphs as well, but. Um, um, or longer texts, uh, but it, uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how useful that is for the margins. Hang on, yeah. hang on a second. So that text that you moved across, it's not just by lines. You can actually squash it because we have problems with that in Reader. Yeah, but you know that I'm an um, sworn enemy to PDF. Yeah, but you ex but this text on the left is from a PDF originally, or not? Yeah, the the EPUB version. I think it has converted it uh, well. Caliber, the conversion software, has probably um, uh, fixed most of the poor line breaks, repaired it a bit. So you're saying this is the EPUB version? Uh, this is uh, yeah, this is the EPUB version. Okay, because obviously I'll give any of you. The full text of any of the books if you want to experiment but i thought this was pdf interesting uh, peter you have your hand up it just occurred to me that it would be nice if we could capture the scroll position and abstract that out onto the clipboard under the cutboard so imagine if you were in the process of scrolling so that you're over the thumb of the scroll bar and 
you drag that to the right onto the cutting board and released it. And then you could get a little bar representing what scroll region was currently visible out of the overall document scroll height appearing on the cut board. So that if you click that spot, it would cause the document to scroll back to that relative location. Yeah, uh, that, that is somewhat related to what Mark, Mark wished for, uh, that he could indicate the place in the text uh, just by, he didn't know where, which word he wanted to select, but uh, he wanted to mark a position of the text. So imagine that the left, uh, it's a very small margin, the left margin could have a, if you tap there, you just do a blob, uh, maybe colored or maybe a word. You could maybe, yeah, just tap it to get the first mark and then you change it or morph it into something more, uh, yeah, w with a meaning to read later or uh, important or maybe have a few symbols that you put in the in the margin. But it should be a very low friction, I guess. So the, the tap as, a, as a, a mark for Mr. Mark Anderson uh, would uh, be the first step. So just clicking and get a blob here. Um, With Duke, Duke, Mark, who was first? Duke. I'm just um, asking if uh, you've tried uh, depth, where the um, cited phrases uh, are closer to the viewer um, to highlight their importance in this at this moment. You mean closer to the text? Uh, meaning larger size. So it appears that they are closer. Oh, uh, no, I haven't tried any any of the more fancy styling or um, I'm a big proponent of having three dimensions or curvy text and so on. Uh, so you can write in different directions, but uh, I haven't had time to play with that at all. Just since we're in, in the process of telling you what to do, Adam, um, you, you already said it would be useful to be able to click on text to see a line to where it's from. But what about some sort of a command whereby you say, show me all the occurrences of this text in another document or in a folder's worth of document or something, like a jumping off point. And sorry, Mark, um, then obviously you. Yes. But, um, Adam, do you want to you want to <laughs> yes. answer Freud's point now? Then I'll come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's natural in a bigger system that you uh, can carry on from a, from any sort of text that you could search for that text. So I, I really agree with that. Hmm. Okay, I just um, I in case my sort of cryptic um, thing in the chat uh, didn't make sense. I, I had something I recall. I mean, I don't particularly use it particularly but i something that i'm constantly running bb edit when you're working if you make an edit in the document you get a little colored uh, line on the scroll bar um so you can add, if it's a very long if you're working a really long bit of text and you're doing do whatever anyway but you but you can see the the places where you've touched the the, the effect of where the document is dirty i guess is is probably the vernacular yeah i, uh, I Ideally, there should be a kind of a mini map showing the whole whole document, maybe with chapter headers um, and proportional length. So you really see how long a, an article or a passage is. Um, I would also like to have a kind of a scrubbing system. As you um, imagine the YouTube scrubbing, where you scrub over the timeline and get a, get an image. I would like to get a few uh, few words from that place just to get a get a taste of the uh, of the text at that position uh, as well at least uh, together with the title or a heading to see where I, i've got one more and, and this may be jumping ahead so you don't want to shut up but looking at the uh the, the cutting board on the right yep so presumably we're predicating we're, we're, we're working on the assumption that the the behind that bit of text is metadata allowing us to know which document it came from or where it came from even though we're not showing that. So that's really useful because presumably part of the idea here is we, we may cut from, potentially we may cut from more than one document into that thinking space. Um, yeah, because I mean, I, when I was, th th this is really nice to see because it, it, it sort of speaks to the thing I was 
so saying a few weeks back about the idea of being able to more than just pull out into the margin as you've done, but as a separate thing. So oh, I want to take these, I want to take these ideas or markers for these ideas. So it might be a position, it might be a something you wrote, it might be a, li a literal bit of text that you've selected, pull it into a blank space. And then as you know, that, and then you can start to do the sort of spatial hypertexty bit with it. And that, that in itself may be enough to resolve the question that's in your mind. Um, you might be playing with order, you might be just looking at the juxtaposition to give you a thinking spur to go back into the document for things you want. But um, <laughs> this is terribly nice. I'd like to see more of these things. So uh, one thing I've been thinking about here is that when you, whenever you do a quote, when you quote or cite the text here, that um, um, that you um, together with the paragraph, even if the source text is far from it or hard to reach in some way, that the, the full paragraph is here in invisible in the background, and that you have a kind of a trim tool, non-destructive trim tool, that so you could. Uh, expand this quote a few words or peek into the, the surrounding paragraph to just see what text it was embedded in um, and trim it just as how you trim a video non I, I love that I love that idea you know they're sort of playing with the same so you, you you put a bit of the background in just to just to, in a sense perhaps to re reposition yourself because let's say you pulled a whole lot of things into into this cutting board um you know the, you may have slightly lost track of the first one so that's a really nice way uh, of being able to uh position it um and also in that context you said you might seeing as the information's there um whether it where on the screen is it's almost immaterial or if we had a nice sort of 3d space you know maybe off to one side but the ability to put to surface that material as well because of course if i pulled in from multiple documents I might want I might want to know I might not want to for instance use something as um, intrusive as color which I could do to say oh, well you know the blue ones come from this document the green one comes from that one but I might want to be able to say oh wait a minute which you you know what's what's the metadata on this bit you know which is which is another way I might want to um, bring back to consciousness why I took that thing from a document which may or may not be now uh, on on screen elsewhere and into that cutting space so Adam you're notion of being able to expand etc that text on the right there could you click on seven standards again yep so i could imagine uh, what you're talking about here when you click on it like that maybe that becomes more of an edit space maybe even get a frame around it where automatically it shows the, the full sentence or paragraph as you said but also you have a ton of controls uh, one of them could be replace all the occurrences of selected text from this same document with just the name of the document. Like it kind of collapses in on itself, like a little thing. Because um, obviously Brandel is pulling my thinking into VR space. And you know what you're doing here just lends itself conceptually to that so well. And to try to develop, you know, on the Mac desktop, we have these piles now. And there are many ways to organize information. So I could imagine these things on the right are kind of clouds. And it's easy to make a cloud, but it's hard to manage it. So it would be interesting if you could choose to expand and contract different elements of that. And I'm also wondering if Brandel has more thoughts on such notions of um, bits of text hanging in the air. Do you, do you mean that it would be kind of an, a, more of a computer uh, created space that's um, or a, a view with that is more compu computer created where it uh, kind of a di like some of the online mind maps is that you can expand and uh, close nodes is that what you're what, what I'm at? thinking about is what you made here is a near invisible interface that is beautiful I don't often say that and mean it because I'm a bit snobby there but it truly is beautiful but also that allows me to think about ignoring that. And just like, you know, you select one, a big box comes up and just for the sake of experimental argument, there are a ton of buttons below with commands just to find out what's useful, right? So we, we don't have to think about interactions all the time because you have the basics and it's really, really nice. But something like, um, you know, you click on seven standards 
uh, buttons below that could include, like I said, hide everything from this document, just show the name, search all the documents that I have for this term, or show connections with line based on these criteria, or organize this space based on when I entered these into the space, so I get a timeline of these things in space, or let me define this thing. Again, hopefully that'll work with visual meta so you can work with author. So just ton and a ton of options, but not yet working on the interactions. Just make them buttons in the beginning. How about popping up a pie menu right over where the cursor is? Yeah, the, well, all the things you're saying, I agree with you. Uh, I just wanted to start with the actual underlying canvas, the idea of the space it lives in and, and the nature of that space and uh, also the visual impression of that space. Uh, this was uh, inspired by the word chromeless by Alan. Actually going, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, it would be interesting to see what, what, what the minimal chrome for those interactions would be um, kind of, a, of course we have the command palettes, we have the, the radial menus that appear from the object or close to the object. Uh, we could also imagine gestures in different way that you have a either pen gesture or a, or a small place where you do a gesture to uh, to express more things. So, so there are many ways to to facilitate that. If you want to have many commands, but uh, still avoid the clutter here. Uh, um, Oh, because oh, Adam, it, we are it, entirely it, on the same page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, most really. people like blank, uh, a bit more, yeah, less less chrome and less uh, buttons and bubbles everywhere. So yeah, I think uh, at I least all Duke. people with standards. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I see Duke and Brandel has a hands up. Duke, please. Oh, the, the question, the eternal question. Uh, uh, how do you envision uh, people uh, communicating with this? And are they now? To others? Yes, others. Or to your future self. Uh... So it's a note-taking tool. The intent is to uh, organize one's thoughts. Yeah, in an in a ideal world, I would like to bundle um, a space and all the direct references, the documents it references in one, uh, at the first, like uh, in the first step, or at uh, yeah. So um, it would be nice to be able to send a whole bundle with the with the source documents and the quotes because if it's text, we can send quite a few texts uh, bundled. But uh, there are copyright re. Uh, things to consider here or so. But uh, if you do a working group, let's say, let's say you are a close working group or uh, people who can share things a bit more freely, the, then I would like to bundle the whole, the whole, the whole view as is. But, uh, but perhaps uh, I want to have the, some of my comments are my personal comments that only make sense to me and some are notes to others. So uh, even the margin could be a tabbed margin where you have the distinction between notes and uh, yeah thoughts, personal thoughts and comments, if comments are for the public or for someone else. Um, but it's, it quickly becomes messy when you have too many tabs and too many versions, and then you're going to export this without revealing your private thoughts or, or, or um, uh, yeah, so some thoughts. Uh, Brandel. Um, yeah, uh, I, I really like the idea of, uh, I, I know um, Mark mentioned uh, colors and yeah, people have mentioned sort of changing the, the representation of each of the snippets of text into the provenance of those texts uh, as text snippets instead. And uh, I, I would uh, definitely go in for having the ability to um, alternate between different representations so that there's not a, uh, while the, the representation, it's, it's recoverable, you can always get back to what you're saying. Uh, having that freeform representational flexibility, I think is really, really essential. Um, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned Cordell's MXs, uh, 
thing, uh, but the, just the, uh, the um, immersive um, data visualization project that he has in VR, but the, the, uh, the ability to, to fluidly alternate between multiple representations, I think it's incredibly powerful. Um, to, the, to the concept of tools and, and icons and things like that, um, I, I would add uh, to, the, to the suggestions, um, uh, and this is, depends on whether it um, makes uh, sense in, in the context of the user interface, uh, but definitely I think in, in iPad and definitely in virtual reality, actually having physical tools, like specific uh, elements that you can kind of pick up and carry with you that represent the different pieces of functionality. Um, I had, uh, if you haven't seen my uh, 2017 word pro uh, uh, VR word processing thing, word reality, um, I, I really enjoyed the, the actual um, um, tangibility of having individual elements, physical things that I carried around with me that I could sort of bring with me or whatever if I needed to, but that represented those different sort of lenses, those different capacities to intervene on the text. Um, and then another thing that I don't have publicly, but uh, that is that is fun is um, making use of hand gestures again within within VR, uh, so that that doing this means something, and doing that means something, and doing that means something, uh, and so that you have the ability to alternate between those things without necessarily even picking something up, but just by being able to change the shape of your hand. And it occurred to me that like those interesting sort of funny hand movements that people have in some representations of magic are a lot like keystrokes uh, and, and in particular hotkeys or corded key uh, inputs. And so uh, by making use of something that has hand, high enough hand, hand tracking fidelity, you can actually create different grips and, and hand poses that represent uh, different commands and modalities um, that uh, don't uh, it, sort of, um, encroach on the on the visual space necessarily or certainly not in a persistent way hmm. any comments on that adam before we go to peter uh, adam i was just saying any comments on that before we go to peter I'm not sure if Adam can hear me. Just to uh, to let me comment uh, on all things because this is kind of a this is an open idea. Um, I haven't thought about everything here. I have a, um, uh, so just jump around and comment. Yeah, Peter. Yes, I think I have an idea for the collaboration side. Imagine if the cut board had a little photo of each of our collaborators on top. And when I clicked one of the collaborators, that would cause everything that isn't visible to that person to dim out. So if I wanted something to be visible to you and Adam, I would click both of your photos. Everything in the screen would dim to say 50%. Then I could go around and click on everything that I wanted both of you to be able to see. And that would cause those items to appear in your shared displays. And if I wanted to add Mark to it, I'd click on Mark. Then anything that I'd previously hit for Mark plus the two of you would become visible. And um, things that are only visible to one of you, but not all of you could be given an intermediate value. So anything that's not visible to anyone would be very, very light. Something that's visible to some, but not all of you would get at a slightly dimmed level. And then anything that would be visible to everyone would be full black. So I could just instantly see which ones of the notes I'd shared with the group and then run around and click on them. And if I clicked on them, while well, any number of the photos were depressed, it would then become black for everyone in that group. So that could be a nice way of just using the transparency setting to mark right away and be able to see what notes were shared with whom very quickly. Also in the side chat, I posted a couple of links to Project Oberon, which was Nicholas Wirth's attempt to reinvent the desktop a number of years back. And he did some very interesting things with how the scroll bars operated and an overall tiling user interface. So you can take a look at that file and just sort of flip through it. 
Um, there's a lot you can ignore. Just go through the parts where he's talking about the user interface in there, and it might give you some ideas. Um, Adam, any comments before we go to Mark? Uh, no, and uh, and I'm juggling one sleeping child here and um, and uh, another two year old. Year old, so uh, I will run them back and forth a bit because, um, yeah, yeah, that, that's fine, of course. Uh, Mark, um, just a couple of things, the reflections really. Something that I was thinking about, as Duke was asking earlier, about uh, multiple use. One of the things that I find myself coming back to looking at sort of spatial hypertexty things like uh, the right hand board there is that um, I find individuals cope with uh, sort of in a sense, messier or less visually pleasing things, much better than groups. Um, and I don't know, I don't know to what extent um, transitioning, try, trying to use the same space for both a group use and a personal use um, work together. I, I don't have a fixed idea of it. It's just not, it's just this observation. I mean, I, I certainly find using these sort of tools myself, one of the things I've trained myself not to do is to stop trying to make it look nice because that always gets in the way of understanding because you're, you're wasting time on aesthetics uh, for a picture that probably only you will ever look at. And the time that you're wasting on the aesthetics, you could be using the understanding. That said, if I've got to share it with someone else, then, then I have the problem. I've got to explain, I've got to explain why it's so difficult to understand because it's not, it's not in an aesthetically uh, pleasing form or in a form that others might easily absorb. Um, yeah, yeah, just a thought. I mean, it's not. I don't think it's a critique. It's thinking we'll go down the line. And I just throw in one other thing. So Brand's hand is up. Is um, I'm interested then in. So what practically do we do with this next to take it? You know, to to sort of start saying, okay, this is a cool idea. Can I now do something with it? What what test can we give ourselves to do to to start to look at, at the uh, at the sort of you know actually how it functions? Anyway, I passed that Brand. Thank you. I, I was uh, really interested. I, I agree that, that that messiness can be uh, problematic in a shared context. And one of the reasons I think that's for, that is because uh, the the people who haven't been party to the assembly and construction of it uh, aren't aware of the way in which aspects of that messiness may actually represent information that's gone into it. And that's one of the things that I was really taken by uh, watching one of Bill Buxton's many presentations at various times in the past. Uh, and talking about the, pr the process of producing a map, uh, drawing a map, uh, being uh, an intrinsically different um, kind of action than merely seeing the, the completely finished artifact. And so to the extent that it's possible to retrieve aspects of the manner in which something is constructed and potentially, if necessary, even seeing it, seeing it reconstructed could be a real, uh, a, a real benefit for people to be sort of clued into exactly why the document is in the shape that it currently is. Uh, and something that I really like the uh, ability to do with uh, arbitrarily long undo chains and things like that, that I also think is uh, underutilized. But yeah, it, it, I think it's uh, it's interesting. And I, I agree that arrangement is useful, but I, I would I love love to have the ability to, to, to get people up to speed as a mechanism to counter it. So we had a meeting earlier today my team and I on how to start marketing author because as of January I'm going to start trying to make it a commercial project and one of the things that I think is quite clear for me to sell software because the market has changed there are few, fewer journalists getting listed on normal listing sites is either very expensive or incredibly arbitrary so we instantly turn the discussion towards community so I want teachers and students to understand that there's a human on the other side of author. So we're going to have to really work on, you know, literally coming to the website and someone saying in a video, maybe, hi, how are you? This is how you use these things. Do you want to have a look? So looking at this here with you guys split screened, I'm thinking of our domain, uh, the future of text that we have to decide what to put on together. And I'm wondering, it could be an interesting experiment if maybe on top there is a recorded Zoom session of all of us, um, you know, maybe in a more horizontal format, you know, laid out, whatever. 
where we basically say almost jokingly, oh, uh, we're just in the middle of uh, one of our meetings. Why don't you come in? But then after that, we try to say, you know, we're working on the future of text. And then the reason I'm saying this now, guys, is something like this on that page. So there is a curated list of gray block area that relates to our books. And if you could make it, Adam, so that both these items do connect to the original documents and you know we would have it linked so people could actually, in some cases, click and it opens the document right there. But also, if we could allow people to have their own spaces and then like we looked at in other areas, if someone has a good collection of highlighted text, we can curate and we can put it on the page and saying, you know, here is Brandel's um, favorite bits of these books or whatever. But just the idea of having on the Future of Text webpage, on the first page, a little bit of hello, and then text you can move around like this, but it's meaningful. It's not just a silly tech demo, that it's meaningful in the way you have it here would be really interesting. Duke, is that an analog hand? Uh, um, uh, let's see. Uh, I, I was just going to paste into the chat. I guess I will. Um, uh, an idea I'm um, working on, because I'm trying to resurrect a project, um, but uh, all, all the kids now are into uh, these DAOs, these distributed ownership uh, projects. And it's on fire. And I'm wondering if that would be appropriate um, for future of text tools, uh, specifically um, since there's so much information in our collective firehose, not only our subset, but the internet in general, um, based on a glossary where um, any a project that we're working on um, is definable quickly um, so that we can engage people and see what they're interested in and what they engage with. Um, in, in case anybody's not um, uh, been uh, watching this, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization, not my favorite phrase, but everybody's using it. And NFTs are non-fungible tokens, which are uh, monetizing projects from the ground up. Meaning the users own the, own the tools. Oh, is that I don't of know. any interest? What's the whole, can you elaborate on the DAO thing? That is news. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's on fire. It's supposed to be, you know, the big thing next year. Um, you may have heard there was an interesting project to DAO to buy the, a copy, an original copy of the U.S. Constitution. Did anyone hear of this? It's about a week ago. <laughs> it's moving so fast maybe two weeks ago or 10 days ago. And it took them a week and they raised 40 million bucks to buy a copy of the US uh, Constitution at um, the auction house. What's it called? Christie's? Um, anyway. Uh, Sotheby's. Sotheby's, thank you. Um, and um, an evil, evil uh, guy read about it. He had tons of money with Citadel. Uh, capital and um, he knew how much they were going to bid because they had 40 million raised and he bid 40 million dollars and one cent and beat them. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. So, what they did because they all paid these hundred dollar per transaction Ethereum fees and everybody was screwed. Now, I haven't followed this up meticulously. My understanding is, is they have formed a new coin called People. And this, this DAO, uh, is it's not made of venture capitalists, it's not made of programmers, it's not made of pre-miners, it's made of the people that did this 100%. So it's a very, very dynamic space. Now you asked about exactly case in point, let's say in all of our sites, including the future of text, we inject a glossary capability to define words that are um, 
generating meaning in, kind of in real time. So DAO, what does it mean? Well, it means decentralized autonomous organization, which means ownership is distributed, decentralized. There's not central ownership. Uh, basically, what's happening is they have a, um, a shared uh, SIG and a governance structure and a treasury and uh, ways to vote on what projects to work on. So people, um, uh, Gitcoin is another example. I can, I can organize these thoughts for you for next week or Friday uh, is another example. This is a, a, a programmer's uh, DAO. It's owned by the community. They collect funds and then vote on how to uh, apportion them. So they are um, generating new work uh, from the ground up um, at an accelerating rate. But uh, how do, does this connect to text? Uh, well, I'm not. Uh, it's a big jump for me. I, I see that there is great interest in, uh, in cryptocurrencies and, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, as you say, it's a very dynamic space and lots of people are working on it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, I think text, like uh, working with the basics of text here is uh, much more understudied uh, because it's like water and it's uh, we're so used to it. So uh, that is why, uh, why I think we should put away the, the Web3 ideas and uh, in, in this community, I think uh, we should uh, look less to what everyone else is doing and uh, start from the kind of uh, the opposite end. What are the kind of fundamental principles of text? Uh, the, uh, the first principles of text, or if we can find some of the first principles of text, just like the first principles in physics, what, is a, what, what are the first principles of text? And can we kind of use them, uh, use those principles to, form, uh, to, to, to inform our d design of text systems? 100% agreement. First principle, but text is useless without readers. Yeah, that, that is why, why, I'm, why I'm really think that the, the idea of active reading, better reading is important because we have so much text so to actually slow down a bit and think more about the text and to improve upon the text is extremely crucial. And also the curation part to, to just pick the best parts of text and present to yourself and others. Um, over. Yeah, I mean, Duke, I have to think more and understand more about the DAOs, but it's not, it seems a bit peripheral to the core mission. But um, Mark, you had your hand up and then Brando. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll, rat I'll rattle through, through a host of things I was jotting down. But um, one of the things that occurred to me was it was the sort of, I like the idea of the glossary and the sense of um, them being able to push through and deconstruct to a, a level of, you know, so, all oh, right, oh, this is a subject somebody else working in, I don't know anything about it, how, how does it work? Um, which takes me to an interesting aspect than something um, that really came out from my own thesis research, uh, it is just the, getting around the, 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 the bad elements of human nature about ownership and attribution. So we say we don't want, we say we want to share, but actually we want to own. What we, because we're we're used we're quite used to putting our arm. What we want to do is bound the problem. So I, I own the stuff inside the boundary. The, the stuff outside is somebody else's problem, and that doesn't necessarily play well with with um, very shared spaces. Um, and also finding ways to make sure that even if you're the person who figuratively is just stacking chairs who no one ever sees because you've gone by the time everyone arrives, is finding a way to actually make sure that a lot of the heavy lift that goes on in the background with some of these shared services by, in a sense, unseen effort is appropriately um, uh, validated in some way. Not, not so much in terms of kudos or something, but just so you actually know that if, if this person is, if this or this skill set isn't in the mix, we are screwed. Because all, 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 the, all the fancy stuff, all the froth on top can't exist with the, the underpinnings. And one other last thought, um, you mentioning some active reading and things. One of the things that I often have found, I'm, I'm reading through something and try as I might, I'm thinking, I don't really get this, but I can think of some people who'd find this really interesting. So, so my reaction isn't, it's rubbish because I don't understand it. My reaction is, I don't understand it. But clearly, you know, it has a form, it has a structure. 
but what I I sort of feel I should be doing in the you know in in, in a sense in the community I'm in is is firing that off to someone who who uh, would find it interesting and can do something with it. Um, so that's another really interesting aspect of you know uh, this broader community around text and things is uh, fostering that. That. Yeah, Brandel. I really like that uh, that notion of um, being able to represent the contributions of uh, of people in and out of synchronicity. Um, uh, I think that's one of the things that's really interesting about Wikipedia. Once one is in the habit of, of digging into edit histories to be able to see what kinds of things actually happen, what not just as you say, because it, it sort of gives some as, uh, aspect of, of uh, recognizing people and their contributions, but also to uh, to understand the way articles and the way things go, the way that, uh, for example, if you were to make an edit, being able to immediately anticipate what kinds of things people would would uh, th then do to it, you know, understanding what sorts of things SmackBot is going to do is, is, is very useful to figuring out um, what's worth 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 doing. Um, uh, but uh, and I, I've got a, uh, a bunch of other suggestions, but one of the things that uh, sort of the discussion of the per sort of periphery of relevance uh, reminded me of is like, uh, being able to help delineate what are the what is the sort of central focus and and being able to kind of articulate a couple of uh, plausible um, non goals for this in that sense that there are plausible things that people could attach to it but that you explicitly want to declare and define as out of scope because there are, there are lots of things you could do to text um, lots of uh, sort of conceptual spaces it can occupy um, and it might be a situation where it's worth exploring a lot of them, but if you have a, a clear sense of things that fall outside of it, um, it's been exceptionally useful for the web web VR folks, the people who are sort of working on the standards to say that their job is not to invent the metaverse, uh, and it, it helps uh, keep out well-intentioned, but uh, but um, uh, peripheral concepts and, and, and ideas that are that are not sufficiently close to, to what they are doing. Um, so. You know, to that to that end, if this is for deep and focused reading, what was the word? The active reading you mentioned, Adam. Uh, I, I think that's a really a, a re really useful sort of central um, uh, tent pole around which to to kind of uh, make sure that other things fit. Um, that said, I have one of particular grab bag uh, uh, idea that I that I think would uh, work in this context and and. Uh, it's heartening to see that you're using Chrome, despite the fact that I work at Apple. And, uh, and uh, um, is that uh, Chrome has um, text spe uh, speech to text uh, has a text rec a a dictation recognition, and so actually being able to make use of um, of uh, speaking things and then having them come up as text is really cool. Uh, this uh, auto dictate thing, unfortunately, as it says, will tell you it only works in Chrome, um, but uh, when you speak, it turns those things into individual snippets of text. Um, you can click on them. And they will actually also play back, uh, and that's where I, um, you know one of the things that um, not everybody, but some people who like to hear text at the same time as they're reading it, uh, and so uh, that's another piece of uh, that can be supported by um, uh, can support active reading, but it may fall outside of your purview uh, uh, is uh, clicking on things to be able to hear them, um, uh, because it, for me at least helps to be able to see and hear at the same time. Um, but yeah, like. As you, you mentioned with the, the, the pen, uh, making use of um, uh, actual stylus uh, input and things that I think is, is very valuable to be able to make more memorable landmarks. Um, but uh, audio is another sort of aspect of that multi-dimensionality that you could uh, exploit uh, in order to um, make these things uh, easier to comprehend. That's really cool. I just opened it in Safari and it didn't work fully, but um... I, I agree with that approach. I mean, in Reader, if you have a PDF select text, hit the S key, it will speak your selected text. It's, you know, it's just for exactly that reason. Um, Peter. Yes, I just wanted to note that I pasted in the script. Hang on one second, phone call. Um. Adam, where you have book of some, I can't even pronounce it correctly there. That's the kind of thing that should be auto extractable as well. So you were talking about maybe some kind of thumbnail on the left and yet another column, but it could be rule-based, you put stuff there. 
So if there is, you know, a citation or a heading that can go there. Yeah. You know, and all the, all the dates, dates or years. So everything starting with a, something resembling a year. Uh, yeah. Even if you have a few false positives, uh, they, I think it would be useful. Also, names are maybe easy enough to recognize and put on the sidebar. And you can easily delete I mean, them if you uh, if it's wrong. We have it in um, reader and author as a way to go into a separate view, but to have it on a column is very, very interesting. And also, I was just thinking, um, you know how aircraft, military aircraft radars work with this? If some object that is seen as out of range is just stuck to the screen. So you could stick things to the top and bottom of the screen, not everything, but you know, to a certain number to indicate there is more here. So that, that could be really fun. So, so one one thing that I really the thing I dislike the, the most here with the prototype is text selection. Um, text selection works fine okay uh, when you want to quote a thing a precise thing uh, maybe to share it or could to copy it because then you need the precision and uh, you don't copy usually you don't copy more than a few, one or two things at a time unless you do some serious work uh, but here i want to bring out small phrases all the time and uh, yeah very actively and uh, the standard selection on the computer to actually double click to get words and a drag over or a drag to the end or um, uh, or the slight delay on an ipad the half a second or a second um, delay unless uh, until you get the the cursor is really hindering the, the fluidity of the thing. So I've been playing with the different text sele selection ideas. Before I've tried uh, clicking to get the whole sentence, but it doesn't make sense here, I think, because you want to extract a small, yeah, small phrases, single word, small phrases, a bit, a bit more often than you want to extract. You don't want to quote as much here. It's not for someone else. It's more as a small anchor to anchor a thought. And then you want to phrase often to continue. So I've been playing with text selection where you click on a first you click on one word, then you click on next word, and then you click on where you want it. So a three three tap, but that is modal by nature, unless you you do it with a with some sort of command key or uh, or hold down several fingers on the screen. So I I wonder if you have any ideas on how to make uh, selection of small phrases more uh, more fluid here. Well, when I'm working with iBooks on the iPad uh, and I'm trying to take notes rapidly so they don't get in my way too much, uh, what I'll do is I'll just draw a little line on the left margin. I'll bookmark the page and just put a little vertical line in the rough region where I want to look at without worrying about precise selection of an individual phrase. Also, I'm sorry about that phone call coming in before. It always happens. A sales call will come in right when you're starting to talk on a Zoom call. Never fails there. So I pasted into the chat window instructions on using the script I wrote to extract the link database from a current Tinderbox file. You can take a look at that later on. Um, also, I was wondering, since we're almost out of time, uh, whether anyone had any Cyber Monday sales that they wanted to draw to our attention for useful tools that might not have surfaced on our radars. Otherwise, I'll have to take off in a few minutes so that I can provide elder care transport for my mom. Well, keep thinking. Uh, along those lines, if anybody comes up with anything, please also write it in the chat. Um, but to continue in this line, Brendel. Uh, yeah, so you, you were uh, talking about uh, different mechanisms for selection. Uh, one uh, thing that uh, it depends on what your willingness for it, but um, if you were to increase the amount of white space between lines, uh, then you have uh, the a potential for in, in being able to include if not different selection targets than different sort of targeting mechanisms. Um, it occurred to me as you were talking about words and word phrases that the, um, the compartmentalization that can result at least in English uh, from things like the visual syntactic text formatting 
Um, I, I sent a link to that last week, but I, I can uh, reiterate to that. Um, it makes use of using things like uh, prepositions um, and uh, conjunctions and uh, and the the verb to be because it's very useful uh, as a as a likely point of um, uh, of disjoint in terms of uh, an idea moving from one place to the next. Um, you could use those as the basis to um, reason about where things are. One of the things that, that's very interesting about being able to increase the white space, using the white space, uh, to, is that you could uh, use the proximity of the click to the center of the word to indicate the resolution of the, uh, to, to indicate the scale of resolution of the, um, the click. So if you have a click that is kind of, um, more approximate, uh, more more distal to, to the actual center of a word, then that can represent the sentence and you can provide visual feedback and affordance as such. And the closer you approach that specific word, the more that selection becomes related to that specific word. So you have kind of um, visual highlighting feedbacking that, that represents that you're going uh, so, sort of into progressively smaller uh, compartmentalizations of text until you end up with the individual word, if that's that sort of minimum level that you want to, to work at it. Um, there were a number of videos uh, at the User Interface Software and Technology Conference many years ago based on hysteris hysteresis-based selection uh, and manipulation that I think are really, really interesting in that that regard. Um, so yeah, so if you if you if you can afford the space, then that's the that that then you can afford to have a. a, a a dimension in which that proximity can become meaningful. And I think that would be a really interesting sort of opportunity for it. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, being able to actually use things like hands, uh, having having different literal modalities based on hand poses would uh, would be able to do the trick as well. But I really like that distance thing too. Um, so so the, the conflicting thing here is uh, predictability. So when you, uh, I think, uh, the, you want to know what's going to be selected or or trust it enough that it will select what you mean if I, if right. I, for example if I, if i click on a name then it's easier to for a human to determine what what that what that name is if i want to drag a name out into the margin or or a time uh, but it needs to be very predictable i th i think i suspect that it's uh, or uh, uh, predict pre or Perhaps it could be that it easy to trim it or inform it after the selection to do a mm -hmm. kind of fixing of the selection. No, I didn't mean that. I meant or that it suggests uh, alternatives in some way. Um, uh, right. Well, that's where that's where the, the 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 visual feedback of what the what the scale of the selection is going to be based on the proximity of the click. So that, so no no click should be surprising. What what may not be necessarily expected is what happens when the mouse moves, but uh, at least it gives you an indication of what's going uh, to happen. So it could be a, a kind of a highlight or like a suggested highlight that the, if you click now, this will happen. If you move the mouse a bit or if you sh wiggle the mouse a bit, it wasn't that and uh, it will try to find a Right. Example. So you'll, you'll, you'll see that that selection effectively kind of increase or decrease as a consequence uh, of yeah. the, the scale of it. And um, if you move to the beginning of a sentence, it's more likely that you want the whole sentence. If you move to the beginning of a paragraph, it could be that you want the whole paragraph. If you would, right, yeah. So if it, you it if a... you uh, yeah do something with a cursor next to something that looks like a name, it could guess that's the name. And if you, if you're in the white space far from it, it's it does something. And if you're close, it does something else. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, yeah it, it's, For example. it's giving your, your selection a size an, an implicit size at those times. I mean, an, another thing uh, which uh, doesn't work with the current ergonomics and certainly doesn't work with people having, um, 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 uh, trackpads nearly as much, but, um, making use of the scroll wheel in, at, at certain times to represent sort of the, the, the default sort of brush size effectively yeah. so that you have, you have your cursor size. Uh, being dictated uh, at least at some times by by that and having visual feedback indicating um, that you you're right now in essentially sentence mode or in word mode or in, in character mode um, but yeah 
Thanks, at, thanks for uh, at least for the prototype, I think it, 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 some of these uh, ideas are quite complicated, so it will, it will take a lot of time. Uh, so, but it will be really worth exploring because people select so much te text per day. So if we could do uh, speed up that interaction and make it more precise and uh, match intentions a bit more, it would be fantastic just as to show the browser companies and uh, um, and the others, <laughs> what could be done. And uh, uh, but for me, meanwhile, I think it, I have. I think I have to override the the uh, the st traditional browser text selection a bit because it's not good enough uh, for the quick like dragging out phrases to the to the margin quickly, very quickly because it's not really done for that. Uh, most of the time, the text selection is a bit in the background, just so you can do the other, t uh, like scrolling and clicking hyperlinks and so on. So, um, but here, text selection is more important, so you can be foregrounded a bit more in the interaction-wise. Okay, <laughs> Mark, sorry to. No, not at all. I mean, I, 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 watching this with interest and just reflecting on the fact that it's like the orthogonal to the sort of selection thing is is th this thing of intent, because it's only, it's something I, I haven't sort of, and maybe people can pop me to, to, to where it is written up, but there, do, there does seem to be, that there is a long axis between, pe at the absolute end, people for whom annotation can and only ever exist attached to a word or something, and other people where it's almost entirely conceptual. So, so, and I'm definitely the latter. I mean, I, I struggle with finding the right word to tie my idea onto. I find it work, it almost works against me. It destroys my relationship with the thing. And, 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 and most people lie somewhere in the middle. Um, though I would say the, the absolutist end, the sort of the, the word-based uh, or highlight end is probably overrepresented compared to what I see. Sort of thinking back to some, I don't know, 14, 15 well, more years of supporting uh, various knowledge tool communities and seeing what people actually do as opposed to what the people who make them think they do. Um, and I just sort of throw that in. And, 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 and that's not a sort of jibe at all. It's, it's more the fact that, you know, annoyingly, we are not all of one type, oh, if only, but we aren't. Um, and so there is this interesting thing, uh, uh, it, uh, as well as all the Really interesting things you just be mentioning about, you know, the the, 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 the motor control part of uh, selecting things is also the intentionality and how and how well and so how that maps to all that nuance you've just mentioned. I think I think it's another interesting area. And if anyone actually can point me to sort of writing on um, this thing about you know how we relate to um, highlighting or otherwise in terms of annotation, I'd be interested because it, it doesn't seem to be much talked about. Mainly because I think there are possibly two communities that just talk way right past one another. So it doesn't surface because they either avoid one another or they just choose not to talk about, you know, their, 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 their view. Watch out now. To circle back a while ago, Adam, what do you think of having this on our web page? Obviously, you're going to have demos and everything up, but having some of this on a very, very interactive main page that links to all the different things. Yeah, it depends on how. First, you need a frame around the whole thing, of course. An entry point, <laughs> it would be a bit strange to do. But um, imagine if we can get an introduction to the whole future textbook and some sort of filtering to the side where you can select articles or themes and uh, and so on and you go in here but who um, then you also need selections for the who is doing this commenting so we, there are many selections for the user to do to uh, to do this um, because it was designed to uh, for an active personal reading experience. I haven't thought so much about how to if uh, imagine that we all do a few highlights from the book. How would that be selected? Or would you follow a person and w walk into their view of the book? Is that uh, their selected articles and their uh, margin comments and some general comments uh, around the uh, around the work? 
Well, Adam, is there a practical test we could do that would help you sort of drill down onto some of this? Because this seems the, nat the next natural thing is, so there are lots of there's really interesting ideas here. So which, which, you know, which bits would it be useful to poke at with the intent of actually getting something into the process to see how the, the, the concept um, uh, what works or doesn't, or, or you know what we need, what we need to resolve next. I, would, would, I mean, would that be a way in which we could help you? Um, I have no idea um, currently, but maybe in uh, five minutes. Wine somehow. Oh, that reminds me. Did you all see that Doctor Who a few years ago? There was someone annoying in the uh, in the TARDIS, and Doctor Who said, "Shut him up or shut him down." <laughs> Just thought that was clever. It means the same thing. Anyway, so where where should this go uh, as a first step? If you if I come back next week with something uh, something changed or improved or uh, explored um what, what would that be for you could be a cryptic one word or a, a single sentence oh everybody else first i'll go last because then i can pretend that your inspirations were entirely mine i'm thinking you want more silence I'm, I'm thinking through the lens of, uh, of what you said, Frode, about if this lived on the future of text site. So that's, that's the framing I'm trying to think through. And while you haven't considered the collaborative aspects of this, Adam, um, and, and that is inherently like a, a huge, you know, kind of balloon that, that you have to, to now think through, um, I would be interested in almost a shared glossary. If someone were to visit the Future of Text homepage, get an understanding of, or, or let's say you see the intro to the book, um, and there are some bits of text that are pulled out that we could aim for a collaborative glossary of sorts that anyone could contribute to. Now that opens up a ton of doors that are like, I, I have not thought about the, the downstream impacts of that, but, in terms of uh, you know a use case that might be valuable to anchor people to when they're reading, um, giving someone the context of uh, a community of experts on how they see uh, some of the key themes within the future of text, that could be really useful. So from that lens, uh, pull at the thread of collaboration and how um, perhaps, uh, and, and this really ties back to what Mark was saying, perhaps how a few different people kind of uh, testing at this and, and seeing what can come out of it. That would be what I'd, what I'd like to, to see. Wait, I, I need to put that into, uh, into more articulate frame. But that's like what, what's running through my head right now. I think that's very interesting, Brendan, to take it in another direction, because we looked at reading and we now looked at collaboration. There's also presentation. Um, I, I could imagine this approach, especially on the right, just the freedom of just having text that can be moved around is obviously wonderful. We all talk about it forever and, you know, here it is and, oh my God, what do we do? But I, I can imagine something where you have a standard paragraph of intro text, welcome, blah, blah, blah. And below that, you have aspects to um, share glossary terms, very happy with that, but also the, the names of the contributors, but also to our recordings. So there would be a lot of stuff, right? A lot of listy stuff. But instead of having it listy, have it more zigzag style, you know, change the view for how it interacts. Like you would have, like this is a block of stuff. You know, you can choose to have it as a list. You can choose to have it as a carousel. In a sense, just playful. Because, you know, someone coming to the page, it'll, be, it'll open their curiosity about what text could be. Right. And as we play with it, we can develop more the level of usefulness. And, you know, then we get into the collaboration of, you know, here is how different people see these different things and so on. Yeah, that's a that's a neat idea. It's almost like uh, having different views of individual summaries. Yeah. And the kind of 
ultimate thing would be, you know, Adam spends a ton of time. We all support him in whatever way we can. And when someone goes to this front page, it is, quote unquote, the ultimate knowledge space for this community. You know, view specs, uh, Mark Anderson put in the text there. So, it, you know, it could, if you wanted to, all the contributors could be rammed up against the left-hand side all the articles on the right, all the titles, you know, whatever. We, you know, we, we start experimenting because you've given us the freedom to do that, Adam. So then people would, it would really be the dream workspace. How do you find out? And as um, both Duke and Brendan have said, here's a glossary to introduce you, but it's a deeply connected glossary. So we're getting very close to very early visualizations of hypertext, but it is not about everything. It is about one single use case. How can a newcomer understand what the heck this group is up to? I, yeah. Uh, uh, just to, to jump the queue, I, I think that um, that per performance and presentation thing is uh, is really uh, critical for the being able to make sense of what that thing is that's being constructed. So if you have a video of somebody talking about it with a live document that is being assembled and, and then actually can be manipulated by the by the user, by the visitor afterwards, then that that, that does a really good job of introducing. So that's a lot of food food for thought, um, Adam. And um I personally feel that in working to make a presentation, you learn, you know, like they say, by teaching, you learn more than your students, right? So if you reverse your active reading to make it active presentation, then the reader who is going to present, you know, has a different mindset. I can't just highlight stuff or pull stuff. It has to be always in mind of someone's going to have to try to understand this. So that, that's why it might be fun to do it this way around. I guess closing question for Adam. Is there anything you'd want us to do to push this forward for you? Is there anything that we can do? Uh, I really like napkin sketches. So if you have anything uh, that is uh, and uh, sketchier, or not, you're not in that sense, but sketchier the better, <laughs> uh, because I really so it's very it's good if it's not good looking, but uh, just like anything, uh, the, an, a small interaction uh, that you like to see or so, uh, something you'd like just a screenshot of something you uh, that would fit in Th that really opens up my mind because it's a, it's kind of generates <laughs> new ideas yes. because now i'm uh, i don't have a clear very direction nice. right now uh, that, that would be very nice who wants to do that now my reality is that the 29th of December, I have to be finished writing my PhD thesis and I have to do some expert interviews and I'm fighting with the ethics board because I do not want to throw away the contact details of these people. They're all people that I work with. So it's getting scary because these interviews have to be transcribed, coded, put in and plus other things. Plus I'm a very slow and stupid student in many, many regards. So I, I, I can't do that outside of these hours, which is horrible. Uh, but what I can say, Adam, is, you know, when you look at the different people in our community, a lot of things present themselves, like uh, Brandel being a new guy here. He's bringing an entirely new dimension to our discourse. So I could imagine a mock-up of, um, you know, welcome to the future of text website. Here is the intro text, but it looks like a document. But what's behind it? Just theoretically talking, every article that the community has ever made Right, so they're kind of hovering in the background. So it's not VR space, but it has the feeling that it should be, right? So the stuff in the middle are means through which we can, you know, either just imagine that document goes down and you just see the space. So you have this central thing, this central presentation, but there are many other ways all these documents come, come forward, right? 
it's dangerous to get Brandel here uh, here with his 3D. I, I've already started looking, glancing at uh, 3D code here, and it's dangerous to see your prototype <laughs> on uh, on Twitter. By the way, Brandel, how do Very you hear about this? Beautiful community? books. Have you seen them? It's beautiful book uh, books. Uh... Yeah, I played. I played through all your stuff the other day, Brando. It was, it was quite fun. Yes, I, I saw. Thank you. No, it, it, uh, there's. A, uh, I'm glad. I, I'm. There's a lot of stuff that I, I. I need to sort of present why it's interesting. I did a lot of technical stuff. Hello, Spider Man. We are making a spider web verse, right? Making a spider. Spider Man, what are you doing? Have you seen Edgar? Mm -hmm. Did you web him on the way? Oh, okay, very good. Uh, Brando, before I forget, uh, yeah, how did you hear about this community? You found us on social media or something? Yeah, yeah. Somebody was talking. Uh, there's a there's a fellow. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, Andy Matushik, and he was trying to to ascertain uh, what kind of scene, what kind of uh, context or social uh, grouping of people were working on fundamental presentation things. He was asking about operating systems. Uh, and, and people pointed to, to, to you and your work. And uh, I, it was on the day that it just happened that the Future of Tech Symposium was the very next day. So, so I was uh, really, really excited and fortunate to be able to kind of file in. Um, I, I, I'm familiar with uh, all, obviously all of the, 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 the grandfathers and mothers of, of the, the movement, but I, I did rec rec recognize some familiar names in terms of the other things. But yeah, it's, I haven't, um, uh, so that, that was the first sort of, entry point into it um yeah very good yeah i just talked to someone today and i just realized i had no idea we did do a little bit of social media marketing but you know it's always better when it's organic in a conversation yes absolutely very good i look forward to friday friday we can continue this but um especially if uh, Raphael and um, Alan join us, then we'll probably talk a little bit more about the scheduling of our, of our community. And don't forget on the 9th, which is in a week, that's the official launch of the book. And of course, Doug's demo anniversary and all kinds of things. So maybe we should even meet that day. I haven't thought about that actually, but at least let's talk some, doing some planning on Friday. Sounds good. Okay, thanks much everybody. Take care. Bye. Be good.